and, and, and Gordon, I, I want you to be thinking, as I give you a chance to say, you know, what some of your folks uh, in your teachers and techies or in your startup that may have some solutions for this, and, and, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, but what I want to ask, uh, and I'll let you go first, Mike, this time, all right, uh, is uh, in the university environment, what specific things have changed because of wireless? And whether that's for the classroom training, or whether that's for how uh, students are being graded and or they're handing in their assignments or if it's something that's got to do with you know what the faculty administration does or it's parents want to know when the next homecoming game is to raise funds I mean I, I don't know what it is but what are the things that uh, has allowed uh, that wireless has allowed in the education environment to be different than it was before well, I think, you know, when I first arrived uh, at Oglethorpe, I felt that, um, you know, the biggest, loudest amount of noise I was getting was out of the res halls. And I stood back, and, you know, we have a ticketing system, and students would send in these things, and they're like, well, they're spending a lot more time in the res halls than they are in the classroom, right? I might spend two hours in a particular classroom in any given week, but I'm living in, this, in the res halls, right? So it wasn't really hard to figure that if we upgraded everything in the res halls where they're doing work and, and watching Netflix at the same time. And yes, they have two devices, three devices in front of them. They're messaging their friends here. You know, so it's, they've got to have both um, you know, cellular and Wi-Fi at the same time. So Wi-Fi has given uh, professors the opportunity to expand how they teach. Um, I've seen it in music and, and other areas where they actually have the students, you know, bring their device, get online, and go to a particular site to work on something. But I've seen everything from Show Me, which is an iPad app, which I thought was phenomenal use of a different type of technology. This particular professor uh, taught science, and it was very complicated. So a student would send her a, a, an email through Moodle or a question through Moodle, which is our LMS, right, Learning Management System. And all, all, not all, but most assignments are delivered there. They're run through, and <clears throat> the professor can then grade that and send it back to the student. The syllabi is there for the course, all the, all the good information, the reading list, things like that. But um, it's, uh, it's important that the, uh, the student has that available to them as they're going through the, you know, the classroom experience. But this particular professor said, look, for me to write out the answer in email, it's going to take me a half an hour. If I get on Show Me on my iPad, I can, it's a whiteboard type of thing, and I can record my voice as I talk through, flip to the next whiteboard, say, here, here's how you do this equation, boom, boom, boom. She says, in you know, three minutes, I'm done. I put that, send it back to the student, send them the link where it's sitting in Moodle. And, and I'm done. And I was like, wow, that's really awesome. I mean, it's just a great way to use technology. Right, exactly. So it's more like Wi-Fi is almost a, what I see is an expected service, if you will. We would call it a service, right? But people just expect to walk in and be connected, right? They expect to walk across a quad or go to a game and be connected and not through their phone, right? Because that costs money. <laughs> right? And gotten a couple of those calls. Why is my son's bill so high? Right? Um, it's Wi Fi. It's part of the, you know, the world we live in. And they're coming out of these environments, whether it's their home or their school, where they're, this is expected that I have access to these things. And that if I want to use an e text and bring it down from the cloud, I should be able to do that. Or if I want to go look at this YouTube video, of a symphony, um, I, I should be able to do that, and everybody in the class should be able to do it. At the so those are some of the things that have changed, and wireless has made it uh, yes. easier it to do that. It facilitates for the uh, both professor uh, as well as the student, so they're expecting okay. this. Yeah, uh, Brian, would you agree? You have things to add? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just the world we live in. I think it's so. I, I very much. And like I observe a lot, and I, I, I 
come to Milton High School during lunchtime and look at a table of 12 kids. And sometimes they're collaborating on the same document and they're sitting right next to each other and there's, they're just doing this. And you can tell they're working on the same thing sometimes because they sit there and they all laugh at the same time. I'm like, <laughs> you're sitting right next to the person. Just talk to them. <laughs> so I just laugh because that is, I don't want to say it's the danger or downside of it, but that's just where they are. They're so used to being in that world. I mean, I always say this, a couple of things that I just thought were very interesting. Like, our kids live in a world now where they wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and they can check to see if somebody said something about them. Like, we never experienced that. That's not a pressure we ever had. That's not anything we ever had to worry about or understand. Like, they'll pick up a device, they'll check Facebook, they'll check Instagram, they'll see what's going on Snapchat, and be like, and then they don't go back to sleep. And, you know, so our kids are just, it's, that's a constant barrage. The other reality is, and I think this is hilarious, is because we never thought about it either, is our kids don't, take, don't ever take a bad picture that lasts. Like, they don't take a picture, get the film developed, get the pictures back and go, I'm getting rid of that one. I'm getting, they, they don't have that reality. They take their picture and they, well, I'm getting rid of that one right now. So they've never had to, you know, so there's no delayed kind of reaction. It's, it's instantaneous. And that's just the way everything is. You know, they want that. And to some extent, we're guilty because, like, I'm very much into, like, I hate sending emails out to the staff about, like, do this, this, and this. So I use an app on my iPad called TouchCast. It's a great way to, you know, you know, create a video, have some, the ability to have some interaction, like, a, you know, the, the teacher to send it to, they can click on the screen and, you know, read a document or go to a video. I can do a green screen behind me. Like, I can do it all by myself. I don't need someone else running it. I love that app. And, um, you know, I send out a five-minute video, like, every two weeks to the staff, and they're just like, please send this. Don't send any more emails about, like, you know, like a, a <laughs> newsletter for the, for the staff. So, you know, it, that's what it is. And then our kids are the same way. So there's a ton of things that are just available immediately at their fingertips, and they're very, like you said, that's the expectation. Right. The expectation is you walk into that environment, I need to have instant access, but then that creates the nightmare of, well, do they have access to everything and should they? Um, and, you know, we start kind of fighting that battle. Okay, did, did, did you were about to say something, yes. Yeah, I wanted to add something, and it's, I'm actually gonna play moderator. Um, <laughs> something that the state of Georgia has mandated is that we move from bubble in sheets for testing to online testing. Um, and at first, with a hardwired lab, we only had a certain number of labs and a certain number of time to run a bunch of students through. So something wireless has allowed us to do with uh, the robust wireless network that we've installed in, at Milton High School. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear some feedback on how successful testing students using technology as opposed to the bubble sheets. So I had a conversation um, before about our testing experience this past year. So if you have ever know anything about testing in Georgia with online testing, and again, being very wired in computer labs, I, I walked into this environment going, what the hell are we doing? Because that two-week window in April into May, there's no consistency. There's, it's, it's chaos because you can only test 400 kids, maybe 500 at the most at a time. And you have your testing window where it's like, okay, I can put 30 kids in this computer lab and then we're going to rotate out. So kids would be on this insane schedule. You would have teachers that would have to be the proctors, but then they'd have to have subs for the classes because when you did your testing program or your testing schedule, well, I'm doing A through N right now. So those kids that were in the lower part of the alphabet, they actually had to go to the class, but there was no teacher there. It was... I just sat there going, this is insane. So one of the biggest things that I embraced when we went to one-to-one -to -one last year was I'm going to cut two weeks of testing down to five days of testing. And we're going to test all those kids in the morning. Uh, let's say we have math on Monday. So all the kids are taking algebra, all the kids are taking geometry. You're going to test from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And those kids that don't have a test that day, you can take the bus and come to school, and then we'll put you in the cafeteria for a study hall for three hours and you can just kind of catch up on work. We'll have some tutors down there. Or you can come to school at 11, get some extra sleep that day. And then on the back end of that, we ran a regular schedule, just a modified, you know, 30 minute classes. Um, so instead of having five days where you're trying to wrangle kids and just have chaos, it went down to two days that week because we had math and science. Um, and 
they were still face-to-face -face contact with the teacher. The other thing I just, again, boggles my mind is that you have the teacher who teaches that subject being the proctor for that test. Like we talk about all the testing scandals that you have and the person who's teaching content is sitting there with their kids going, okay, start the test. I'm like, oh, you're just setting them up for problems. So we, we were able to pull those teachers out. We put kids, you know, we, again, Fulton's done a great job as far as creating those access points in every, every classroom. You know, there's some principals that want to say, I want to test all 600 kids in the cafeteria. I'm like, that's stupid. You have access points in every classroom, just put the kids in the classroom with their device and, and go. Because, you know, as long as you're doing the testing on the front end, which we did, like we made sure, you know, the state does a big test of the capacity of, of the system, so they have everyone, you know, in the state, you know, supposedly log in and see if the system can handle, the state system can handle that, that, um, that drain. But then we did at least two more days where we just try to get kids online. When we did our biggest testing windows, we had 950 kids taking a test, I, I, and we didn't have any issues. King, Kenny here, and, and, and uh, he's kind of biting his tongue. I'm just hoping that the principal of Alpharetta High School is watching. I, <laughs> I well, shared. Do you have, we, we have our first online question. Uh, OK, great, because I was kind of looking to see if there is an online question. Uh, uh, I'd say I think there's a lot more that, uh, and I'll be happy to arrange a meeting between the two of you if you kind of want to get that. <laughs> I, and I do have to say this. So the one thing that the technology helped when that, with that experience this past spring, like kids weren't stressed. Because that two weeks that we're doing EOC testing, where you weren't with your teacher for two weeks because there was a wacky schedule, also overlaps with AP testing, which is the more important testing window. Because that is really the one indicator for the kid to say, I'm going to apply to Georgia Tech and I need to get a four or five on this AP exam because my friends are you know, Perfect. doing that well. So. Uh, what I'd like to ask you, one more question before we get there, and, and then uh, Gordon, I, I want you to, uh, you, you've been hearing a lot, right? I mean, there's obviously a lot of things that, uh, we, that allow for, what are the gaps here, right? I mean, I mean and, and, and some of them we've heard and there's probably more that can be talked about. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, I mean, there may be a problem that uh, I, I think Kenny was saying that the schools were built to be bomb shelters. Heck, we can't get anything wireless through them, right? So maybe that's another problem, right? I mean, that, uh, that, that needs to be addressed somehow. But what is it that uh, Mike and Kenny and Ryan can, can help the startup community with saying, how can they find out about what are some of the opportunities and challenges, and how do they get through the bureaucracy of trying to get through the system? So, uh, I mean, is that something that, uh, that I think the startups would like to know? I just want to relate an anecdote of, in terms of a nimble startup who was faced with this problem, and he had built an app that was uh, actually geared towards helping kids with special needs interact with iPads and and um, those things in school. And he kept showing it to the uh, instructional technology folks, and they said, this is great, but we're never going to roll out one-to-one uh, -one tablets anytime soon. And he said, why? And it was the kind of uh, hidden consequence of wireless. There's, there's one wire that you can't lose, and that's the power wire. You've got to plug in. And so these instructional technology and CTOs were saying to this uh, entrepreneur, we can't use these iPads for everyone because they run out of power by lunch. So he came up with a creative desktop that integrates, essentially it's one big power management desktop. And any device, or iPad or otherwise, Android desktop, it has connectors for every one of those. And it has all day power in it. So that's what he's doing now because he saw for schools to go one to one, they need a way to plug to power these uh, whatever device it is, and to me that's the most nimble way you can be. Uh, I'm not sure if that if you guys have solved. How that does that problem. work in the system, right? I mean, and, and and how would you like to see it? Understanding from your side, the business that I mean, people just walk in and say, here it is, and they can't just install it. So so what's a way for them to w work their way through this maze? Well, we do have a lot of vendors that sell directly to schools, and that's uh, sometimes a, a mistake because then the school needs help, and we don't really have the resources to provide help. Um, we do put out bids for things um, for various technologies. Um, we, we have quite a few vendors that are finally coming around 
and not providing a software that was written for Windows 3.1 anymore. Uh, <laughs> and and it no, doesn't require a Java plugin or a Flash plugin. They're actually moving to HTML5. Uh, we need something that works on an iPad. You know, the, the, the iPads won't run, was it Flash or whatever, but uh, the, the Steve Jobs wouldn't let it, let them. So we have to have HTML5, and we don't want something that, um, that requires a specific browser if possible. I do realize a lot of people's products are not compatible with Microsoft Edge yet, but I don't use it anyway, so it doesn't matter. But um, we, we need it to be work on Safari, Chrome, IE. Um, it, it needs to be work across all of our platforms. Fulton County, for in their infinite wisdom, decided to issue or allow schools to pick from five different devices on three different OS platforms, and I have to support that. So, uh, so I'm very amicable to that, to, to, to software that works across the platforms. Then we'd like to know how wireless has really improved the graduation rates, right? Or virtual learning using wireless. Or, so, I mean, that's the whole thing about effectiveness, right, that we were talking about. So again, you know, at Milton, and, and I'm like, and, and just to let you know, Lynn's from the PTA. I know. <laughs> Talk. Um, I mean, so at a place like Milton, one of the things that we found, and, and I'll address the, so you have in, in the state of Georgia, you have Georgia Virtual, which is you know the, the provider for online content, but we also now have Fulton Virtual. So there's Fulton County teachers that provide that instruction to the students. When was it three years ago? I think they started offering both, and there really wasn't a limit on how many kids can take a, a virtual class. Last year they go, um, hey, this costs money. So you can only have 200 kids at your school take an online class, but you can't tell a kid they can't take an online class. So when I do my, I do my budget in February, and I have to kind of think of everything that is, might happen at a place like Milton, I don't, I didn't, when I did the budget then, I didn't know that there was going to be a cap on the amount of kids that could take an online class each semester, and then they come back and say, if you go over 200, we're going to give you 200 seats. If you go over, if you go over 200 seats, we're going to charge you $115 per kid. So then when you have 350 kids taking an online class and you get a bill for, you know, the few thousand dollars, you're like, okay, my budget's pretty much set. I didn't know this. So then you got to go to the other end of, all right, for next year, what am I going to do? Because the other reality we got hit with was, do you, are you gonna, are you gonna tell a kid no? Because I, I gotta stick, I gotta be a good manager of my money. But then you can't tell a kid that they can't take a class. You have to give access to everyone. So that was one of those first things. And then our reality is we don't have a lot of kids that want virtual classes. They they value that face to face. There are other schools that really will front front load and back load their, their, when they build their master schedule. Hey, we want all of our seniors to take either the move on one ready or their virtual classes, first period or sixth or seventh period, whatever their last period of their day is. Those campuses are, no one's there in the beginning and they're cleaned out at the, in the afternoon. Maybe it's because where we are and, and look, I will always, you know, kind of toot the horn of our faculty. We have really good teachers. So I think our kids value that face to face piece. I would prefer that we have more kids take that, you know, take the advantage of the virtual piece because I, they're going to experience it at one point. They're going to have to take a class online, and you know, you you have to be very intrinsically motivated and, and good with your time and and really monitor that. So, have we seen an impact? Probably not at a place like Milton. Cause we just don't have enough kids that will take advantage of it. I will say the places we've seen it. When I was at Creekside. I fully leveraged online learning because we had kids that, I mean, I had a kid one time was an 18 year old. The judge told him, you gotta go to school. If you don't go to school, you're going back to jail. So he walks into my school, how many credits you have? Oh, two and a half, and you're 18 years old? I really need to leverage online learning right now to get you up to speed. And I said, here's what your reality is. I respect the fact that you're trying to get your education, but I'm not gonna have an 18 year old man sit in a freshman health class with a 14 year old girl. I'm not gonna do that. So I need to leverage the technology now. So here's a laptop, you're gonna sit in this classroom and you're gonna start getting all these credits that you need to graduate. 
and and that's what you do. So like you find ways to make it work. You look at the situation. You really try to embrace it and and help the kids that need the help. Um, but you know, again, it's going to look different everywhere. It's a, it's actually a really good question, and um, it's sort of interesting because we. There's a number of different measures in higher ed, right? So how many, what percentage of the students end up graduating after four or five or six years, right? Um, and in a way, you're, uh, well, it's sort of the expectation of the student is that these things are available to me. Uh, I think it would be extremely interesting to find out, I don't know what level of surveys you do in Fulton County or at Milton, who's using Khan Academy to remediate themselves, right? To get some, hey, I don't understand this concept. It would be very interesting to find that out uh, from a score perspective. But I think to stay competitive in the higher ed market, you have, to, you have to stay current. And to go back to, we were talking about students, what their expectations are. We were the push generation, uh, most of us here, not everybody. Right, where at eight o'clock on Tuesday night, Happy Days was on, right? And you watched it then, or you didn't see it, okay? They pull what they want when they want it, and they're not, you don't push things at them. Um, the only thing you can push is sports, live sports. That's, you know. Um, otherwise, it's, I need this right now, at this moment. Um, but I think time will show that there's just no other way that it is an extremely effective way to get people educated and educated in a, uh, well, effective and efficient way. And I think it's, uh, we're just seeing the beginning of the wave, but just like the internet, you're not gonna stop it, or Bitcoin, or any of these technologies, it's coming. There's just, there's no doubt about it. And the ultimate thing as, you know, as Americans, we want America to prosper, and I think that we're going to leverage technology to do that. Where does the education tech community go to find out more? Yeah. My Twitter handle is Startup Angel. That's one place. Um, we have, uh, like I said, these different organizations, uh, one local being the teachers and techies, but nationally, there are ed tech accelerators and incubators that are being formed all the time. Um, I just finished mentoring at one this, uh, today that Points of Light is running their Civic X program. They have different uh, themes, and the theme they're working on uh, this, this year is education. Um, so if people want to get into that kind of a program, which is sort of a flashpoint um, geared towards education startups, I can, I can give you folks uh, the directions for that. Talk to principals too. Come to schools. I mean, well, yeah. Knock do our your doors customer down. customer research. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I sat in a meeting today. We're we're going to be piloting a program uh, next month called Text to Tip, where it's an anonymous platform for students to be able to connect with a real live, you know, real time counselor because they're stressed about something, and it's it is completely anonymous. There is a live person at the other end. Um, I think it's going to be a huge thing for our kids because we live very much in a place where even though I'm sitting right next to you or you know I, I'm I seem confident in my stuff we have a lot of kids that struggle they're stressed out about stuff and they they're afraid to ask for help because it would it might mean that I'm not as good as you and so they they, they struggle with that and so they kind of keep it in so you know that for me when they came to Milton and said hey would you want to be a part of this I was like yeah because if if our kid ends up not cutting themselves or hurting themselves or, you know, starts relying on a substance, um, then that's helped that one kid. So maybe it'll help more. So Brian, was that a startup that came, did they call you up and say, hey, can I try this they're, in your school? They're in Chicago right now. Okay, so, but they got through to you. Yes. Yeah. Through Fulton a, County, through, through, through a so commissioner. Came, so. Okay. But, right. you know, again, it, it's, it's for schools. So, you know, you got to knock on our doors and I'll be more than happy to let you in as long as Fulton County lets me. Yeah, I get a lot of phone calls from a, a lot of startup companies and Nobody. people looking to get a, a foothold. I would say that, um, you know, i always willing to talk to people about what, what's your idea, where do you want to go. I always think in terms of front end and back end, right? SaaS is, you know, putting it in the cloud because content's got to come from somewhere. 
it's got to be somewhere where I can turn around and say, okay, I know with a degree of certainty that the risk I'm taking because of where you have my content stored, right? Because remember, we're dealing with all, all kinds of personal private information, personally identifiable information. So the back end is really important. And of course, we just talked a little bit about the front end. You know, it's got to work in Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and yeah. NIE and Edge. I, I went to an EdTech conference a couple of years ago, and the um, CTO of a rather large district, I think in North Carolina, had a really um, sobering statement for startups. And he said, even if you've got the best product in the world, I'm not going to buy from you because you're, you're a startup. And even if you give me your product free, there are costs on my end that I have to absorb, training of my staff, server administration and it takes a year to two to three for this thing to get rolled out across my my entire system and you may be out of business by then and so he was basically following the well no one ever got fired for by an ibm because you know like pearson maybe they're not the no. most innovative but they're going to be there we used to say that all the time when i was with ibm yeah. there you go it's <laughs> an advantage when you walk in right like in higher ed, a smaller private school is going to have a yeah, much better chance because we're more than willing to, this not to be, I don't yeah. want to say it's the wrong way, but we don't have 17 gigs of, of bandwidth to, to worry about and backhauls and, you know, it's a, it's a much less, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a more forgiving environment, but there's less risk and we can maybe deploy it to a small group and see how they do with it. And I think there's opportunities there. But of course, if, they, if it's specifically for K through 12, I'd have to leave it to uh, my friends at Fulton County and Milton here to... I think this is a great discussion, and I, and I know people probably want to go on and on talk about this if we see the interest here. Uh, but we've, we haven't taken any questions from the house. I think there's one right there. How much of a hindrance is it in the classroom when you have students who now have the availability of wireless to get on social media while in the class. I live across the street from Milton High School. So I, I know now with Brian as the new principal who to go to for sound complaints. But <laughs> it's a beautiful school. Yeah. My sons went to Milton High School, the old Milton High School. But it really is a beautiful school. And I went in there to, to speak to a class one day about what, what, what security is for, you know, and I went through this whole thing with them. They've got their Wi-Fi locked down pretty good. I mean, there's, you know, as far as I can tell, I couldn't get on without a special uh, access code. And even then, it was very restricted. Frustrated. Until a yeah. couple of days ago when they hacked very. WPA. I don't know if y'all know that. Well, yeah, the WPA too. <laughs> yeah. well, things happen. Well, right? you know, but and, and that is like, so when I look at the classroom, so they can't access Facebook or, you know, Instagram or Twitter or any of those. Or uh, YouTube. But uh, YouTube, YouTube is restricted to, restricted. to uh, you know, there has to be an educational tag in the, in the video content. Um, that being said, they, they find ways around it. Like, I'm not even just like, you know, I'll <laughs> Gee, sit there. You know, that, what's that you know, take, Kenny? Now, <laughs> if they're on, if, if they're. You're Georgia Tech student. Yes, exactly. I mean, the, the, the higher. That, any of those kids. Well, <laughs> again, walk to the cafeteria and go, I'll talk to you, I'll All talk right, to you, I'll talk to you. Do we have a last question from the audience here? Oh, um, I, was, I don't think this can really be answered, honestly, because I was just thinking um, with the test taking on uh, these devices, uh, she was asking if graduation rates or our graduation rates going up, and all I was thinking was, well, they should be because it's easier cheap. Because like with these devices, like people just take people, the the sharing community amongst cheating is becoming bigger and bigger. So it's just like all you have to do is take a picture of these questions. Okay, or... so I I think I get it. The right. So in his case, he's proctoring his exams, right? So you go in, you don't have anything with you. The only device you're using is the device he supplied, right? In higher ed, use product like Turnitin. Right, so I run your paper through Turnitin, and it'll tell me what percentage of it has been plagiarized. They use that in high school, too. They use it in high school, too. Yeah, we too. use it. We have a subscription. So 
Yeah, the authentication of who you are, that is a real problem with distance learning, right? Because I don't know if it's really you sitting behind the, the, the computer or not. Is it your friend who really knows the subject well, or is it you? So working through these issues, and part of it is time, make sure it's, it's fast, and there's authentication methods to make sure it's still you and not your friend answering the question. And, and so uh, an, an issue we ran into was, and this was like literally days before testing this past spring, the, the state platform for the EOC, the, the reality is, is if you minimize the window during the testing, then it kicks you out of the test, and then you gotta explain to the person proctoring why did you minimize your window, are you trying to open up another one, so then that create, you know, you, you eliminate that. So we have Microsoft Surface 3s. A kid showed me this, and I was like, you've gotta be kidding me. They did a three finger swipe, and opened up a brand new, um, not window, but a brand new desktop. That's how they got out of it. And it took me, all of 10 seconds watching the kid do it, and I made my own video and... And provided it to me. And provided it to them, and this, <laughs> and it was funny because if I can do it, and I, you know, and I'm not that nimble with it, so I'm like boom, 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 and then like just acted like, oh, there's someone coming by, and then swipe, and then the other one's back up. I was like, we are gonna be so screwed because the kids will have this mastered in five seconds. <laughs> the, re the, the email I got back from a person above me said, do not share this video with anyone. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not posting it on YouTube. I just, I'm trying to make well, you aware of this because it's yes, gonna be a nightmare. Yes, we are, we just did. <laughs> they fixed it from what I understand. It was, it was Okay, a, all right. I, in the 90, early 90s, right? The boss key, yep. 80s, yeah. Right, that's right. right See, there. this has been really popular and, and, and I really appreciate all of you sitting here and thank you again for your time. I'd like to give a round of applause to our panelists here. Thank you so much. Uh, really interesting topic, and I'm sure we'll do this uh, again sometime next year to come.